My name is Steven Fluin. As Aaron said, I lead developer relations for the Angular team. And today, I'm talking about Angular for the Enterprise, which is basically the worst talk title ever. This, this is a quote according to my wife. That's a terrible talk title. Because when we think about enterprises, what do we think about, right? We think about stodgy, big corporations. We think about silos. We think about lack of communication. We think about all the problems that come with this idea of an enterprise. And I want to kind of subtly change that, because I think that we, we often see things that are not connected to that problem, right? And here at NGConf, we actually have a really, really unique opportunity. Many people here work for big companies. Many people here don't work for big companies. But I think that we all have a lot in common. We all are really trying to do better at our jobs, right? This is why we're looking for technologies. This is why we're excited and passionate about the future, because we're trying to do better. We're trying to do better for our bosses. We're trying to do better for ourselves. We're trying to do better for our users. And this really is something that connects us across the board. We also all struggle with the same things. One of the traditional mindsets that I often see is that companies don't want to share information. Right? The bigger the company you work for, the more strict they are about confidentiality, the more strict they are about secrets. We all need to have our secrets because everything's special and unique to us. But I, I really want to subvert that a little bit and say that we're all struggling with the same things. And this is really, really special. And this is why ng-conf is so special, because we can come together and start sharing those sorts of things. So when you think about the word enterprise, I don't want you to think about the traditional definition. I want you to think about a new definition that's really based around family. So imagine sitting down for a holiday dinner with your family. Right? You're going to talk about the things that are frustrating you. You're going to talk about the things that are going on in your lives. And we can do that. right? We don't have to violate the confidentiality of our organizations or the projects that we're working on in order to share our challenges and successes. So to change, to completely dispel that mental image, I've got this picture, nice little picture of my family. And what this really represents is the fact that we all are able to find commonalities with each other. right? We're able to find challenges that we're facing. And by coming together, we can do better. So we actually did a little bit of this earlier this year. We brought together around 20 different enterprises that are using Angular at scale. When I say scale, I mean teams that have maybe hundreds of developers or billions of users, companies like Charter Communications or Deutsche Bank. And what we did is we brought them together, and we wanted to really open up the, the lines of communication and drop those barriers and really share and connect to each other. And so what I want to do is I want to actually go through a few of these questions. And I'm, I'm going to bring the eight most asked questions. So what happened was we, we brought all these people together. We said, hey, what, what are you facing? What are the challenges? What are the questions that you have representing your team? What are the questions that your company has? Because we all want to know what everyone else is doing. So that's a very common thing that we see. And we're all kind of looking over each other's shoulders saying, hey, how can I do a little bit better? So I'm going to break this down into these eight questions. I have a, a secondary goal here of, of what I call reducing the information asymmetry. Because oftentimes, the Angular team, we think we're putting out really clear, helpful communications about how to do things and how to think about problems. But oftentimes, those things are not necessarily being heard. So a few of the things that I'm going to talk about are challenges that we felt like we've addressed in the past, but they still come up as questions. They still come up as some of the core challenges that developers are facing. The, the other part of the information asymmetry is that each of us have different solutions. There are problems that I have never run into, no one on our team has run into, but you've run into. And by sharing that and ideating with other folks, you can come up with cool solutions. And I want to share some of those solutions that those people came up with today. So I'm going to start from eight and work backwards. So starting with mobile apps. We all need mobile apps, right? This is one of the first things I heard as a consultant a long, long time ago is, I need an app. And my, question, my response to that was always, why do you need an app? Right? This is a question that many people forget to ask themselves. So when you're thinking about an app, really think about what is it you're trying to achieve. Are you trying to achieve an experience that's going to be permeate all of the devices that a user touches? Are we trying to have a presence for marketing purposes? How are we trying to engage our users? Because why you need that application and how you're trying to touch your users is going to influence the way that you do that from a technology standpoint. And when we think about mobile applications, we tend to think about three technologies. The first is obviously PWAs, right? You're building an application. You want to add some additional capabilities, then enrich that application and connect with your users a little bit better. 
But the other two that I, I think are really important to mention are first, Ionic. So if you want to build an application and ship it with a web view that's going to be running the same code and be delivering these experiences that feel like they're customized for each platform and taking advantage of platform capabilities using JavaScript APIs, Ionic is a fantastic way to do that. And then there's also native script. If you're willing to invest more into your application, willing to spend more time to customize, instead of having just HTML templates, having native script templates, you can actually take advantage of the native widgets of a platform in addition to accessing all of those capabilities of the platform using JavaScript. All right, number seven, shared components and open source. So this question takes a lot of different forms, but one of the most common ones is, how should I organize my components? Right? We've moved from having a small shared library of 30 components up to 100. Now maybe we have multiple teams that are working on components. And that creates challenges. We don't know how to structure and think about those. And so I want to propose a, a really simple mental model for how to connect those different components. So I, I would say that there's about three layers that you need to concern yourself with when you're thinking about how to architect your components. So most teams have a design system. Even if you don't intentionally have a design system, you'll adopt something like material design, or you'll have an aesthetic that you're trying to achieve. Right? That's the underpinnings of everything you do from a component standpoint. Then we have the visual components. These are, what does my app look like? What does it feel like when I touch it? Does it animate? Does it react to everything that I'm doing? And one of the newer types of components that people are trying to build and share across teams is the idea of business components. And I've seen this one grow a lot in the last year because as teams are building out more and more of these capabilities, they want to take advantage of more and more and more of the functionality and not just the visuals. I also think there's another axis to this, which is that oftentimes we see that companies have a company-level visual components, company-level business components, but then every single team wants to add a couple standard components that they're going to use across the team. And we, we see this at Google as well, right? So you'll have the company-wide things, and then you'll have team A, team B. And I think that's fine, right? But if we reflect the organization in terms of the architecture of our components and the packages that we're shipping, that's what's going to ultimately end up benefiting our users. And always, don't forget the CDK. The CDK has a ton of great capabilities out of the box. And Jeremy's going to talk a lot about what's going on with the CDK on Friday. When it comes to organizing and thinking about component libraries across an organization, I would say that collaboration is key. We often see teams where they have what they call shared source, where it's private to a company or private to a team, but anyone can access it, anyone can see it. But I would say open source is always going to be better. My, my favorite example that I always go to is VMware and Clarity, where they not only built a design system and then a set of components to manifest that, they actually encouraged that adoption outside of their own employees for use by partners, other teams, and this created a more continuous experience for their users. The, once you have this mental model for how to organize your components, there's the question of the ownership. How do we actually manage all of these different teams working together? I would say that mono repositories help. There's a lot of really great information across the internet right now about how to start moving towards a mono repository strategy. But if the team that's building a shared component library, whether it's visual or business, can be in the same repository as all the tests for the applications using the, these components, you're going to be more effective. You're going to be able to accept changes from anyone and know that those changes are going to keep working. Right? This is essential to how Angular moves fast without breaking the entire universe at Google. There's also the idea of developing a culture around these things. Many of us are very hesitant to say anyone can get in and change these things. But if you have the right tooling to validate and manage the changes that are coming into your component library, this culture of sourcing all of that content upstream and sharing it is going to drive the agility and flexibility of your company across the board. All right, number six, hybrid applications and mixed environments. So this often takes the form of, there are other teams, right? We, we work at companies, and there's maybe someone not using Angular. Again, this is always shocking to me. Every time I hear it, I gasp. But it does happen. And there's a lot of different ways that we can solve this. One of the cool technologies that's out right now uh, is called NX from the folks at Narwhal. And one of the features they, they've released in the last few months is actually support for hybrid repositories, where you can have a single repository that has, for example, a TypeScript library an Angular application, another Angular application, and then you can have an, another application that's maybe not Angular. And the way that they've tapped into the build system allows you to actually rebuild all of those in the right way, so that when you make an update to your TypeScript library, 
all of the applications that consume that are going to be updated. And this enables more sharing of code and more collaboration without having to live in different silos where you're building things completely separately. The other way that we really think about this idea of collaboration in hybrid environments comes down to Angular Elements. So Elements is really powerful in the way that it allows you to create these web standard interfaces between different applications. Right? If everyone's using Angular, then you don't need to worry about these sorts of things if you're in a monorepository. But any time you have to create an interface for someone else to consume, that's when you should start thinking about Angular Elements. And this Angular Elements strategy even goes further. If you think about content management systems, oftentimes it's very hard to integrate all of a framework or a platform into a content management system that you already have. Right? We, we talk a lot to teams that are using Adobe Experience Manager, Drupal. There's lots of different CMSs out there. And they can be hard to enrich. But if you're able to supply and offer functionality as custom elements using Angular Elements, that's going to help that. Because you can actually rely on the browser for the rendering. And theoretically, we could possibly live in a future where you can rely on the browser to load the functionality of that component as well. Next up is testing. Now, I think I've gotten up on stage three years here consecutively and said, who tests? And we get, we get a few laughs. It's still probably worthwhile to consider testing. What I would say is virtually 80 or 90% of the biggest companies that we see actually do this well. Whenever you're building a product that's going to last for more than six months, the maintainability of that product ends up becoming almost more important than the upfront cost of maintaining those tests. Right? You cannot have agility in a large software code base without really good testing. And the Angular team actually provides a couple tools. Right? We have Karma for unit tests. We have Protractor for end-to-end -end tests. And these are generally very good tools. Right? We have support for things like cross-browser. So you can test on multiple different browsers the same application. But as we've seen, the ecosystem continues to evolve. We hear a lot, even at NGConf this year, about technologies like Cypress or Jest. And teams that say, well, what should we use? Is it OK to use these things? So the Angular team opinion is that we believe in the future of Karma and Protractor. We believe that uh, we've got some plans that are going to make them better and awesome for developers. But I would say, if the developer experience that you're trying to build is easier to build and test with one of these tools, go ahead and use it. It's OK. Just don't tell the rest of the team I said that. <laughs> one of the things that I hadn't even been thinking about when we brought up testing was this idea of visual testing or creating screenshot tests to verify that the app continues looking the same as you continue to evolve it. And so we actually put it out to all the teams that we were working with and said, what do you use? And so the two most common tools that they talked about were Storybook and Apply tools. So using both of these as ways of automating different scenarios, different conditions, and then using that out to render screenshot tests that then you can integrate into your application. One of the fun things when you're sitting down with family is that you can rib on each other a little bit. So I'm going to rib on the, all the folks that asked this question. Should we build a PWA? Do I need that PWA? I think the answer is, is in almost every case, probably. Because the questions that drive you to build a PWA are pretty simple. Do you want faster, more resilient user experiences? And do you want deeper engagement with your users? If you want those things, yeah, you should consider adding a service worker to your application. And the Angular tooling tries to make this really, really easy. And so that's a really simple answer. But then there comes a much bigger question. What if my organization isn't supportive? We, we've actually heard about many teams and companies being actively hostile to the idea of adding progressive web app capabilities to their sites. Uh, and to that, I would point them at this URL. So chrome colon slash slash service worker dash internals. If you visit this URL, you will get in your browser a list of all of the service workers that were installed on your machine based on your normal everyday browsing habits. When I went to this, I had 254 installed on my application, or on, uh, installed on my laptop. This is not a niche technology anymore. The biggest brands, the biggest apps and sites out there are using these technologies to accomplish better experiences for their users. So sometimes I rib other folks, but I was actually shocked. I had my eyes open, because one of the questions that I didn't even think that we needed to care about was this idea of A-B testing or experiments. And to, to broaden that a little bit and give a few more examples of this, we actually there's a whole concept of release management that today Angular doesn't help you with very much. right? We don't do A-B or multivariate experiments. We don't let you turn on feature flags for your application, stage releases. And what we've seen is that more and more people are needing these tools as they continue to ship their applications at scale. We also see use cases where, for example, if you want to release a new feature, 
you want to have that feature secret until it's actually ready to be used, but you need to be able to test it, you need it in different environments. And you, you don't want all of these features and capabilities to bloat your bundle size. And so we, we kind of put that back again on all the folks we were talking to. What do you do about this? And so what we found was that in general, this is not a Angular specific problem, but it, it does become part of the, the realm of what we care about. And so what we heard is that people are using technologies like rollout IO and launch darkly to manage the feature flag. So they had this administrator panel. They have all the control they need to set the flags that they want, the staging releases, all those sorts of capabilities. And then what you can do is you can put all of those bundles, all of those different chunks onto a normal C uh, CDN and distribute that to users. So what we see, the kind of angular side of the solution there, is that you ultimately do end up needing multiple builds. You do a build for each feature flag. But the key there is if you do it at the lazy level, so any code split level where you can just have a single chunk dedicated to a purpose, that's where it's going to be most effective. Right? So you can have your same index page, and then you chunk out based on what the capabilities that you're trying to ship are. The number two question. And it was actually funny. At the event, we were having everyone raise their hands if they cared. And these, these last four questions, every single person cared about. So I know that this is a, a challenge that people are thinking about. And Igor talked a lot this morning about this idea of an evergreen Angular. And that's definitely what we're trying to do. Because that's how we see that we're going to make you most successful and how we're going to continue to be able to evolve. But sometimes you know how to update, but how do I get everyone else in my team to stay up to date? Obviously, ng update is the core capability there. This inversion of the responsibility between you and Angular, where we want Angular to be responsible for making updates to your code base, is huge. We've also started to develop quite a track record. So you heard about that KLM story. That is a really great example of where we, we made these promises more than two and a half years ago, and we've been keeping them ever since. One of the, the strategies that we've seen is driving the adoption of the latest version via shared components. So if you're working on a shared component library, you can almost use your leverage, use the fact that other teams depend on you and rely on you to start pushing them and say, hey, if you want the new capabilities of our shared component library, you need to update to the latest version. Right? Just these subtle drivers. One of the things that we've also seen people need is oftentimes developers have a really great understanding of what semantic versioning means, but people on the business side don't always understand that very well. And so I would just remind them and, and give them examples of how if you're using semantic versioning, a major release does not mean a major amount of work for you. And the Angular team is really, really committed to following the, the formal definition of semantic versioning. And then I, I really do think just sharing stories. As I started off talking about, everyone is looking at, over their shoulder. Everyone's wondering, what is everyone else doing? And so pulling stories out, like the KLM story about how they updated in less than a day, that can really help drive home the point that these are not crazy things. The last story that we told as a family of enterprises was all about build time. Everyone said, how do I make my build time faster? Right? I have way too many components. I have way too many developers all working on this giant application, and I need to split it up. So historically, the answer, the kind of not great but best answer that we've had was really have more independently compiled libraries. So take some of the components that you're shipping and compile them as an Angular library using the Angular package format, using ng-packager, using the built-in support, all those sorts of things. But we're, we're approaching a point today where using technologies like Bazel, we can actually opt into those finer grained things. So with Bazel, you're going to have the ability to opt in or not. Right? If you don't opt in, you're still going to have a single monolithic build target, which can take advantage of some of the incremental capabilities, but not all of them. But if you're willing to opt into saying, hey, we have a large team. We have many teams operating within the same application, within the same mono repository. Here's the dependencies between them and being able to map that out. Then we can take advantage of that knowledge to actually make more incremental builds and really optimize the process for everyone. So this is definitely going to be the solution. And if you're willing to try it, uh, definitely I recommend checking out those office hours or meeting up with the team. So we've gone through the eight questions, the, the top eight questions that came up when we were talking about Angular in the enterprise. And I, I think that just like we had the feeling at that event where we were kind of starting to feel like a family, we could share anything, I really want to drive everyone in this room to feel that same way. Go find someone else that has the same problem as you and talk about how you're solving that problem. Talk about how they're solving that problem. Because together, we're obviously going to be more effective. 
So don't be strangers. Say hello to your neighbor. This is what this conference is all about. We always talk about the hallway track being almost more important than my talk. So everyone that's not here, great job. Not, not quite as good job as those that came, but it's OK. But share all the problems that you face. Find new solutions. And don't forget to share those solutions, too. Thank you so much. Thank you.